Hello. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to today's live stream. What's up, KC? What up? How's everybody doing today? I'm just petting my dog. He's uh, feeling lonely. Uh, what's up, Aaron? Hello, Moon Boy. What's up? Hello, hello, hello. Um, yeah, so it's Thursday. Went and got my weekly massage in. Feeling good. Live notifica notification bell, gang. What's up, Matthew? Thanks for coming. Uh, yeah. What's going on? Um, good news. Jim's Carprofen showed up. That's that's puppy, puppy, doggy, doggy style. That's doggy uh, ibuprofen. Showed up. Got him taken care of. He's walking much better now, feeling a lot better. So he'll probably be on that for the next three or four days, giving him one in the morning, one at night. And uh, eventually his little doggy limp will go away. And he'll be back to 100%. Um, so yeah. Yeah, man. You doing good? Are you feeling all right? You want to lay down? You want to lay down in here? Can we turn the gym cam on? You going to chill? What do you think, man? He's like, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Here, you guys can... Where's the gym cam? Where's the gym cam? Jim. You okay? <laughs> He's like, don't look at me. Don't even look at me. Hi. How are you doing? He's so zoomed in. Dude, can you, you want to lay down? What's up, resilient loser? What are you doing, man? <laughs> What's going on? He's like, I just don't know where I am. Okay. Okay. Well, you do what you want. I'm going to just set the camera. There you go, right there. That's perfect. That's perfect. You got beautiful hair. How old is Jim? Jim is uh, 10 months old. You need to flip the gym cam size with your cam. <laughs> oh, and he's leaving. You, you scared him away. Where is he? There he is. Bye, Jim. See you later. Stop looking at me. <laughs> okay, that's enough. <sighs> I'll turn that off. Um, yo, got the notification. What's up, Mike? Good. Very good. Jim's 10 months old. Experiencing some growing pains. Growing pains in his, in his bones. <clears throat> he had them uh, at about 10... No, when was that? That was October. The last time. So, like, five months old, it hit him initially. And then then it hit him again at, like, seven months old. And here we are at ten months old. And he's getting another blast of it. Um, it's pretty common in this breed, uh, from what I've heard from other uh, Shikoku owners. Yeah, he leaves as soon as I start. He doesn't. He doesn't like hearing me chat much. Sometimes he st sticks around in here, but usually he leaves. But um, yeah, so uh, sh a bunch of different Shikoku owners that I've talked to said that it's pretty common for them to get growing pains. Uh, it's called panosteitis. Uh, it's pretty common. Um, usually will happen off and on until he's about a year and a half to two years old so we've got uh we're, we're about halfway through it <laughs> so it'll probably come on every other month until you know he's well, yeah i mean we're 10 months in it's not even a year is it deadly no it's 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 just it, it's it's growing pains it's he's growing his bones are growing so he gets inflammation 
in his uh, long long bones of his front legs, and usually it only affects one at a time. It's not deadly. It's just he gets pan, it's called panosteitis. It's just inflammation in the in the one of the front bones, front limb, limbs. So it's not it's not any it's not a big deal at all. It's like I said, it's very common, completely harmless. Groin pains. No, growing, growing, growing pains. Dog is growing. <laughs> yeah. It's like it, it's like if I was going to compare it to anything, it's like shin splints for people. But shin splints aren't necessarily from growing. But still, I mean, that's kind of the same thing. Um, that's probably the closest comparison is shin splints. Um, so, but yeah, it... Sometimes it just gets painful for him to walk on uh, one of his legs, and it comes out of nowhere. It's really, it's really weird. It's just like he'll be, you know, doing. When it, when it first started happening, we were like, "What the fuck did we do? Did he like jump off the couch or something?" And yeah, it just slowly like starts to come on. He'll start to develop a, a mild limp, and then you know, if you don't give him um, something for the inflammation, it, it turns into a big limp. And, you know, he won't want to put any weight on that leg at all. And then, yeah, it's it's the first time that it happened. We didn't know what to do. And we were kind of like, is this going to go away or what? And we just kind of waited it out. And it got so bad. He was like laying on his side on the ground. I, apparently, it was just like radiating so much. He, he, he actually just like started crying because it hurt. I'm just like, damn it. Okay, well, this is annoying <laughs> for him and us. Um, so, yeah, at that point, then I was like, okay, we got to go to the vet and see what's going on, and make sure it's not like a fracture or something. And they said, no, it's just he's growing, and uh, that can happen. Um, but, yeah, they said it, it'll probably come, you know, every two or three months. Um but yeah, I, I don't know. He's he's a rare breed. <laughs> doesn't usually happen. Uh, doesn't usually happen to uh, most dogs. I would I would guess because a lot of dog owners have never heard of it. But um, talking to specifically Shikoku owners, it's it's very common. So, but yeah, he'll be fine. He'll be fine. He's he's been through it before, and we just you know you give him the dog ibuprofen and. Uh, it knocks it out really quick. You know, you give it to him for a few days and the limp's completely gone and we go on about our life. And in a couple months, it might show again. And, uh, you know, just make sure we have it on hand so we can give it to him. And it's really weird. Uh, it, yeah, it's really strange. But it's very manageable with Carprofen and, you know, going through six to eight pills across three to four days with it. So. Not a big deal, but it's just kind of something that a lot of dog owners don't get to go through. <laughs> um, anyways, Winducks. Hello. Do steroids cause hunger by themselves? Thank you for all the info you give us. I definitely experienced... My first time was the worst. My first cycle, I got the craziest hunger from it. Like, it, it was the weirdest thing. Like, I, uh, I had, I had the worst appetite. Like, like, in, in, in the way of, I couldn't stop eating. It was crazy. And that led to, you know, it, it, it was like binge eating to the point where it was like, I would get so much bloating and inflammation from it and edema. It was insane. Um... So it's definitely something you got to watch out for. But again, you know, I, I say this all the time. My first cycle was just stupid. Like I had no idea what I was doing. Wasn't prepared at all. I don't think anybody can be, you know, completely prepared for it. But I didn't know anything about edema. I didn't know anything about angiotensin. I didn't know anything about aldosterone. I didn't understand any of that. I didn't know that, you know, an influx, a surplus of calories, sodium could cause, you know, some, some serious issues. Um, but yeah, it, it absolutely can increase hunger, you know, in some people. 
Uh, I say, you know, if you go, I imagine if you go about your first cycle, your first time going into it, um, you know, you go into it uh, slowly, start with a low dose and work your way up, it probably, you probably won't notice an appetite increase. You know, my clients um, that are for like getting started, a lot of my clients are really new to this um, cycling and they just want to, my help to kind of guide them through it. Um, they haven't been experienced in it. So I, I, I imagine it, it's very much, uh, very much, uh, dependent on your dose as well. So, um, <clears throat> I guess I could timestamp that. Probably worth time stamping, considering two days ago I got zero time stamps. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I got, I, I got, I was like an hour and a half in and realized I didn't have any time stamps. I was like, well, fuck it. I'm not gonna put my first time stamp at two hours in. Uh, Joseph, hello. I get a pain in my upper thigh at the bottom of a squat or leg press. I'm going to get physio soon, but any tips on relief in the short term? It's only in the left thigh. Um, strong chance it is uh, some sort of impingement, or it could be uh, yeah, I mean, something do to do with your hip flexor getting um, getting kind of pinched in that uh, area, you know, when you hit the bottom of a squat, is that what you said? Bottom of the squat? Yeah. Um, I feel like that's pretty common and, uh, probably what you need to, uh, do is more time relaxing and stretching out in the bottom of a squat, you know? Um, so what I recommend is literally like while you're watching this, even <laughs> you could get down in a squat and and just chill just breathe try to relax if you can't do that that means you you're super fucking tight um like you should be able to like while you're watching like if you've got your phone you should be able to set your phone on the ground squat down into a full squat with your palms on the floor in front of you your feet flat on the floor and just chill and you can like use your elbows to push your knees out to the side and just try to relax for, you know, five to 10 minutes and uh, just put yourself through that as much as you can. And you're going to feel a lot of things start to loosen up and stretch out and uh, improve your mobility because there's a lot of different things that can cause something like that in particular um, to flare up. Um, so I would say just sit down in the bottom of the squat and try to relax and you could do it right now. <laughs> you can start doing that while you're watching this. When I first started doing that kind of stuff, it was while I was cooking, you know, I'd put something in the microwave for four minutes and I'd hit the start button and I'd squat. I'd just squat down and I'd just chill and I'd wait for the timer to go off. Um... And I would do that every time that I ate. And over the course of a day, I would accumulate, you know, like 20 fucking minutes of sitting down in the bottom of a squat. Um, and over time, your hips will loosen up. Your spine, your back, your erectors will, you know, become more mobile. They'll loosen up. Your glutes will loosen up. You know, your hamstrings, your calves, your shins, your quads, everything will get nice and stretched and loose and mobile just by spending more time down in the bottom of a squat. Um, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot, a lot of benefit to squatting, a lot of benefit to just chilling in a squat. Um, something interesting is that, you know, countries that don't have toilets, countries where they have to squat to take a shit, they have zero hip issues in their country. You know, they have they have no problems with their hips in those countries. So squatting daily 
and uh, getting comfortable in that position is is uh, a big deal. So, um, and then once you get good at squatting, once you get good, like, and I would say being good at it would be being able to sit down in the bottom of your squat for 10 minutes with flat feet, hands flat on the floor, you know, or not, torso completely b between your thighs, feet flat on the floor, just chilling for 10 straight minutes and have no issues, like feel, feel good, be able to stand back up and get on about your day, no problem. Um, 10 straight minutes, no breaks. So that's a goal that you can work towards. Um, I used to be able to do it. Um, I imagine maybe in a week I could build up to that again. I wouldn't be surprised if I could sit down in a squat for maybe five or six minutes, like now. Um, I haven't done it in so long, but the thing is, like, once you get the ability to squat for 10 minutes with no break and be comfortable doing it, you kind of retain a lot of that ability for a long time. It's kind of like riding a bike almost. So, um, so yeah. Watching Chase's live for an hour in the bottom of the squat position. I mean, seriously, like, it, squats... Squats are chairs for some people. <laughs> like you should be able to squat comfortably. You should be able to sit down on the bottom of a squat comfortably. You know, you should be able to browse your phone in that position. But yeah, it takes time. It takes time to build up to it. Um, if you do it daily, you should be able to accomplish a 10 minute squat in a month's time. Um, but yeah, just force yourself to do it. Like I said, I, I, uh, I made it a habit to squat while I was cooking, and that time builds up, uh, you know, across the days, and you get really good at it. You get really comfortable at sitting down at the bottom of the squat, and then it transfers over to when you're in the gym, and your squat will look really fucking good. Um, you'll have no problem, you know, hitting depth, so... Oh, what up, Jacob? Just ordered some pitava statin from the pharmacy source. Way cheaper than any American pharmacy. Um, congrats, Jacob. Uh, do you use airlock on every spot? Uh, it's hard to get the air bubble to stay up when at an angle. Also, it's okay to inject some air, right? Bro, I injected a milliliter of air this morning. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong with injecting air. Um, not a problem with it at all. Um, I try to airlock every single shot that I do, but yeah, of course, you know, there's going to be some angles where it's just, it, it's not going to happen, but, you know, like pinning the lat, for example, trying to pin a lat and keep the air bubble at the back, like you've kind of got to like try to lean into it to get the air bubble at the back end of that syringe. So sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. Um, but yeah, uh, there's nothing wrong with injecting air. Like I said, I injected a milliliter of air this morning because the way that, um, the way that uh, genotropin pens work, um, the genotropin pen has the water already situated in it and then you have the powder on top of it. And you go and you start turning the genotropin pen and it starts pushing the water up into the powder. Well, while it's doing that, it's creating air pressure in that chamber. And, uh, you know, if you don't do anything about it, you know, while you're cranking on the pen, if you crank the pen all the way until the water has completely covered the powder and then you turn it the rest of the way to like lock it to its final position, there's a shitload of air pressure built up uh, in in that uh, pressure built up in that chamber now. And if you take a needle and stick it down in it, or you take a, a pen needle and stick it on there, it'll shoot a bunch of your a bunch of your product out about um, what about well, it was nine nine was that three IU's worth? Yeah, so about three IU's worth. It'll shoot out the top. Um, so I have found that if I take an insulin needle, pull the back out of it, and just stick the needle down in it, it'll let that air escape as I'm twisting on the genotropin pen. And then when I get to the very end, it'll shoot that that three 
um, I use of, of genotropin into the bottom of the insulin needle. So then when I pull that off, now I've got the three I use in there, but now I don't have a plunger in the back of that um, syringe. So what I do is I take my shoulder and I jab that um, growth hormone pen in there. And like I said, I don't have a plunger on it, so then I have to take my plunger, stick it on the back of that needle, and get positioned to get that plunger back into the... Uh, uh, barrel and so in doing that I'm essentially I've got basically a milliliter of air between the plunger and the uh, the product and uh, and yeah so I just push the plunger down um, injecting all that air and the three I use of uh, growth hormone so <laughs> I mean it's not fun but I don't want to waste three I use, I mean, that shit's not cheap, you know? I mean, that's... I mean, that three I use, what is that? That's like 15 bucks? <laughs> so, you know, I don't want to waste it. <laughs> that genotropin is uh, it's liquid gold, man. So, yeah. Um, that's the way I go about doing it. You know, I imagine most people probably wouldn't, but whatever. Yeah, so... The thing is, if you don't do that, though, and, and let's say you stick an insulin needle on there that has the plunger on it, that plunger will just go and shoot all the way up to the back, and you might not get, like, you know, you'll just see it spray the genotropin all on the inside of the plunger, and it's just like, fuck, you know? So, through trial and error, I've learned that that's pretty much the best case scenario um, of not wasting any, so... Yeah, it works. It would make an interesting video. If I made a video of that, people would be like, what the fuck is this guy doing? <laughs> yeah, there'd be so many people being like, this guy's an idiot. What's he doing? It's like, well, it's just the way I do some things. <laughs> don't care. No hair, don't care. <laughs> Just looking at my uh, emails real quick. All right. Um, damn, I should have timestamped that. God, I'm, I'm getting terrible at remembering to timestamp shit. Um, how long do I wait to check my bad CRP levels again? Listening to Vigor Steve today, and he was saying using the wrong oil could cause high CRP as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. Steve is kind of, uh, uh, an oil Nazi. Um, I personally haven't, I think he's, I can't remember which one exactly he's, like, really against, but, um, I, uh, I don't, uh, I don't see any issues with using MCT oil. I don't think he's against MCT oil. I can't remember which one exactly he's not a fan of. I imagine it would probably be some sort of... Something related to vegetable oil. I, I would imagine grapeseed. Is he just... Is he only against synthetic oil? Like, like just EO? I, I don't know. I, I don't watch... I didn't watch enough when he was talking about... That kind of stuff. Because I only use MCT oil. And I don't have any issues with it. So... Um, what was it? Arrakis oil? Who the fuck uses Arrakis oil? I don't know. I'm not using it, so I don't, I don't know. It doesn't apply to me, I guess, but... Um, Arrakis oil? I don't know about that. That's... Uh, I don't know anybody using that shit. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know any... It's refined peanut oil. Well, peanut oil in general, that's a terrible idea. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't use that at all. I mean, peanuts are not... Peanuts are not... Uh, it's in the Mexican sustenance. Well, don't buy anything Mexican. Jesus. Like, we get all of our shit turkey. Um, yeah, peanut oil is... Like, peanuts in general, like peanut butter, is highly, you know... Um, <laughs> is, 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 is very uh, high on the... Uh, 
inflammation scale. Like it is definitely not like that's why you, that's why we choose almond butter instead of peanut butter. But peanut butter is so fucking good. But yeah, I certainly would never inject something that is, you know, m made from peanut oil. You know that that sounds terrible. I mean, that's a no-brainer. I would never make something out of that. Like that's that's ridiculous. So. <sighs> All right, moving on. Oh, so, no. I didn't even answer Mason's question. Um, how long should you wait? Mm, I mean, I don't, I don't know, dude. Um, I mean, I would probably just give it a month if you're really concerned about it. I mean, you could also get your homocysteine checked as well it's kind of a, a way to sort of like triangulate you know it, it's almost like similar to getting your creatinine versus cystatin c checked it's not as uh, drastic as that it's just another way to check to be like you know if my homocysteine is off then and my crp is off then it's like okay that that's an issue um so I mean, I'd probably wait a month and just make sure that you take, you know, a good three or four days off from the gym and make sure you don't cheat on your diet. Make sure you're you're sticking on your game plan, you know, and uh, that'll that'll let you know if you're having like some serious systemic inflammation issues going on, you know, because a lot of people fuck up and they'll have like a, a big fucking cheat meal the day before their blood draw and that screws up a, a ton of numbers <sighs> he still developed scar tissue with eight different spots can you it's highly unlikely i mean eight different spots that's that's crazy considering a lot of guys use only their glutes and delts and get along just fine so having eight different spots highly 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 unlikely that you're going to develop any scar tissue issues, you know. Um, I'll definitely give that a try. What up, dude? I tried your dead hang routine before warming up and training chest today, and it definitely helped my shoulder impingement. Going to do it before every workout. Yeah, dude. Dead dead hangs from a pull-up bar. Like I said, I take my, my straps, my Versa grips, and I just latch you know, myself onto the bar and just hang and uh, just try to elongate, you know, my shoulders, my spine, everything. Just try to relax and uh, get as long as possible and do that for a minute and, um, you know, take a minute break and do three sets of that before every workout. And that keeps my, as long as I'm doing that, my shoulders stay good to go. But the moment I freaking get lazy and stop doing those within a couple of weeks, my, uh, you know, I'll get some sort of Im imbalance, impingement going on. And, and then I, you know, have to take time off. It's, it's a vicious cycle. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta stay on top of that because it just keeps, it keeps my shoulders working properly. Um... Are all blood markers increased if you work out 24 hours all? I mean, all's a pretty big word. <laughs> no, not all. I made a mistake last time I got blood, so I'm taking three days to chill before my next one. So maybe it'll be more accurate. I mean, not all. All is a very strong word. But there are a lot of things can get, that can get thrown off. But certainly not all. Um... You know, for example, uh, cystatin C will not be thrown off. That's why we do it. So, um, but yeah, three days to chill before your next one will be plenty of time. Yeah, yeah, you definitely need to wait a few days. But yeah, it doesn't throw all of them off. That's that's being very uh, silly. <laughs> Um, can you elaborate on carnitine dosage again? 
you said you recommend 1500 per day as optimal dosage should it be dosed once a day or more times a day right you just emailed me about this um prior to opening this uh live stream um yeah so jonathan asked in his uh oh sorry your name's not <laughs> jc jc jonathan whatever um he asked uh um he said the he he he's asking for the most optimal dosage um, to go for, and you know the original formula, the original formula um, for the loading phase and the maintenance phase was 200 milligrams per 55 pounds of body weight was the loading phase, and then 100 uh, per 55 pounds for the maintenance phase. Now, you know he brought that up, and then he said. What do I feel is the most optimal number to go with? And I told him 1,500. I said 1,500 regardless of weight. Um, 1,500 is the number that I found that, yeah, men, women, weighing anywhere between 130 pounds to 270 pounds, find 1,500 to be a, an excellent number. Um, and he was asking, you know, with regards to if supply of uh, carnitine is not an issue, you know, that's what I would do is 1500 every single day. Um, and, you know, that that's, as I've said, from our users, from everybody, you know, that has tested it out and, and has been using it for long periods of time, we all tend to find that 1500 is probably the sweet spot for everyone. Um, you know, a thousand is a great dose too, but I feel 1500 is, is really where it's at. But yeah, um, a lot of people that use carnitine only use like 200, 400, 500 milligrams a day, and they don't really notice much from it. Now that doesn't mean that it's not doing what it's designed to do. Like, yes, it is certainly still doing its job. It's certainly still working. You're just not feeling it you know, to the full effect. And I know, you know, we really shouldn't be dosing our products based on feel, but carnitine being that it's an amino acid and not a drug, I feel that, um, this is one of the things that we can play around with a little bit more. Um, so yeah, just because, you know, you're not feeling it doesn't mean that it's not working. It certainly does work at, you know, 100 milligrams per 55 pounds of body weight. It's certainly working, but I feel that a lot of people want to be able to feel something from it because that's the fucking world we live in now. So if you want to feel it, you're going to have to use more. And 1,500, you can't really go wrong with. The only thing that's wrong about it is it fucking sucks to inject it. So... um so that's that's the only downfall to carnitine is having to inject the amount that is uh, you know worth taking for a lot of people. A lot of people don't really want to use it if they can't feel it like that. So so yeah, regarding your question, fifteen hundred every single day. Personally, I liked dosing it all at once, all pre workout, and uh, going about it. Um, that way, that way I don't have to, you know, go into injection mode more than one time a day. You know, I, I just, once I'm doing injections, I, I just want to get them all done and get on with my day. Because injecting, injection time sucks. <laughs> injecting is no fun. I don't like injections. I just want to get it, get it on and, and get over with it, you know. So, that's. Uh, that's that. Is it feasible to homebrew 75 milligrams per milliliter L-carnitine? No, it's not. Otherwise, we'd be doing it. But it's not. <laughs> it's not. So, you know, the, the thing that you need to understand is that the higher the concentration that you take it, the more painful it's going to be. Um, just like anything. And uh, 600 is pretty much most people's limit. Um... And I feel that, <laughs> um, and I feel that 600 is 
probably as best as it uh, is is the maximum concentration that we can get it. Um, personally, I've never tried to make it at 750 milligrams per milliliter. You can try if you want, but I have um, I have talked to some other guys that wanted to try to brew it at higher dosages, and uh, I'm pretty sure it failed. Um, but the thing is, dude, like, you know, look around. Are there any companies selling it at 750 milligrams per milliliter? Are there any companies that are selling it higher than 600 milligrams per milliliter? You know, like, I sell it at that. Amino Asylum sells it at that. Um, I mean, those are the two main people selling it. And a lot of people sell it at fucking 200 milligrams per milliliter, you know? So... <clears throat> yeah, yeah, a few years ago... The, the thing is, the reason that people like it at 200 milligrams per milliliter because it's fucking painless. <laughs> it doesn't hurt at 200 milligrams per milliliter. Um, the, yeah, like I said, the higher the concentration that you make it, um, the higher the concentration you make it, the more painful it's going to be. Um, and yeah, some people don't feel my 600 milligram per milliliter um, carnitine at all, and some people do. Um, Isaiah being one that doesn't feel it. Uh, personally, I don't feel my 600 milligram per milliliter. Um, but yeah, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people have, uh, issues with it. Um, so, all right, JC, that's enough talking about it. You're, you're going too far into talking about homebrew stuff. So, um, if you want to talk about this further, then please email me. <clears throat> Because, yeah, we don't need to be talking about homebrewing shit in public. Got it? Got it. So, yeah, um, the that, that's the reason why you don't see it dosed any higher than that is, number one, I don't think it's possible, and number two, if it was possible, it would hurt like a motherfucker. So, it's just not, it's just not worth it. <laughs> so... K? K. Glad we handled that. I mean, yeah, dude, 500 milligrams per milliliter, that's pretty standard. That's why 600 milligrams per milliliter works pretty well. So. Moving on. Um... I didn't like when Steve recommended Nandrolone only. Yeah, I just I don't see I just don't see the reasoning for it. You know, I mean, everybody everybody's got their own way of doing things. Everybody's gonna have their their thing. I just I don't I I don't see I I don't I don't see the I don't see the reason why people would want to do that. Like. Why, why would you want to leave out testosterone? Like, I just, I just don't understand it, you know? Like, that's a bioidentical hormone that we kind of need for everything that we need testosterone for. And if you're not injecting direct testosterone, like, I feel like some things are going to be lacking, you know? Um, yeah, sure, you can take Nandrolone only and then add estrogen to it, but I just don't... <laughs> when I tried it, my wiener stopped working. Yeah, that doesn't sound fun, you know? And that's what I would imagine would happen. So, yeah, it just, it makes no sense to me, but, you know, every, everybody's gonna try to... I don't know. Some people will like it. I imagine a lot of people will hate it, but, you know... Uh, it is what it is. There are a million different ways to go about using gear, I guess. Um, how to know if the trend is true? <laughs> um, well... <laughs> Send it in for HPLC testing. Move on with your life. 
Send it in for HPLC testing. That's the only way to know if it's true. Is injectable creatine a thing? No. Um, yeah, dude. If you don't know if your trend is real or not, send it in for testing. Um, because, yeah. I, I mean, I feel like it should be pretty... It's not like a surefire way to know if it's real or not, but the first thing is if your trend is clear, <laughs> if it's not gold, if it's not golden in color, that's a that that's a big red flag to me. Like I want it to be yellow, I want it to be gold. I understand that you know, a lot of people tend to think that the more rusty looking, the more oxidized it has become. I don't feel that that's true. You know, a lot of people think that the more brown and rusty it is, the more it was heated. I debunked that because I made trend without heating it at all. And it was the most brown rust color I had ever made it at. Um... So yeah, I think that that idea is completely thrown out the window. It just takes longer to make it without any heat. Um, so yeah, I, I think that uh, if somebody's trying to sell you trend that isn't gold, that is maybe a hint of gold, that means they fucking diluted it down with something else. Like it should be fucking yellow. <laughs> It should be super fucking yellow. It should be gold. It should look like fucking, you know, vitamin B piss. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you uh, that 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 should be number one. Um, Because I've, I've heard of people, you know, sending me... Well, I've heard of people. I've had people send me pictures where their uh, their trend was, cl like, clear with a hint of yellow. And I was just like... Yeah, I mean, if that's trend, somebody diluted it down with something else. Um, but the, the, the surefire way to know is to, you've got to send, send a sample in for HPLC testing. So... Um, and also, like, some people will be like, well, did you get trend cough? Like, that's not, that's not exclusive to trend. Uh, something that happened, when was that, Tuesday? Tuesday, I did a quad injection. I got uh, cough from it. <laughs> Haven't had that in a long fucking time, but I did a quad injection on Tuesday. Um, forgot to bring that up to you guys. Um, I didn't have, like, full-on cough. But as soon as I was done injecting, I felt um, like this slight burning sensation in the back of my throat. And it did make me kind of just go like <clears throat> a couple times. Um, haven't had that in a long, long, long fucking time. But guess what? I'm not on trend. That was on a test and primo mixture. So, um, so yeah. Uh, if you want to say trend cough... Look for trend cough. If you don't get trend cough, it's not trend. That's not that's not real. That's not true. Um, trend cough is technically it is called a pulmonary oil microembolism. It's when a little bit of oil leaks into the bloodstream and makes its way to your lungs. So, and that can happen with any oil product. That's why it's called a pulmonary oil microembolism. <laughs> embolism. Just add an embolism in my throat. Um, you know, and not a pulmonary trenbolone <laughs> microembolism. So, because <clears throat> some people would be like, well, just uh, dab a little into your vein and see how that feels. Like, that would make you cough with any, any steroid that you use. What's up with the prices of protein and creatine? Shit is unbelievable. Almost three times what I used to pay. Um, I don't know. I guess I haven't really been paying attention to it. So, I have no idea. Is it? I, I really don't know. I guess I haven't been paying attention. 
Um, is it? I guess I don't, I mean, I don't even remember what I was getting it for before. You know, I guess I had, because uh, I, I mean, I get all my protein and creatine for free, so I, uh, yeah, I'm not, I guess I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really in any place to um, <laughs> know that. Um, let's see, I just got a two pound isotope. It's forty-five dollars for two pounds. Yeah, I feel like that might be a little high. <laughs> I, don't, I really don't know though. Creatine is creatine high? Do we? Does Redcon even have creatine in stock right now? I bet they don't even have it in stock. Um, let me see. I'm curious, because yeah, creatine's super cheap. Is it more expensive? I'm scrolling through Redcon stuff right now. I'm just curious. Like I said, I, I really don't pay attention because I just I get it all for free, so I don't I really don't know what things cost. What? It is. There we go. Grunt, Tango, Cluster Bomb. Well, Tango is creatine. Oh, wait. Creatine monohydrate. 34, $34 for 60 servings. And it's out of stock. It's not even in stock. What about Tango? Tango's out of stock, too. Are they all out of stock? All the flavors? Huh. Yeah, that's interesting. All the creatine at redcon1.com is sold out. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and it's it does seem like it is more expensive. Because, yeah, creatine used to be really, really cheap. Now we sell 60 servings for $35. Yeah, that's interesting. Huh. I had no idea. I hadn't, I hadn't been paying any attention to it. Very interesting. That's a bummer. I wonder what's going on there. Why is there a shortage? I had no idea. Interesting. Um, added 100 milligrams of master on a week to my 200 TRT dose last six weeks. Getting blood work done next week. Will the mast affect my total or free test levels? No, it will not. It will have no effect. Um, three to five mils a day, no issues. Um, I've qualified for Canadian Nationals, but I know I'm still not big enough to win. Would you still do the show, or it would be a better choice to take a big off-season year and re-qualify in 2023? Ooh, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a tough one, because part of me would want to do the show just for the experience, like I could see, I could see argument for both ways, you know, so that your first time there when maybe you could win it, you won't be so like nervous because it's not your first time there, you know. That's my only thought is maybe, maybe it would be uh, a benefit to do the show just for the experience of going through it, but you know. It's probably not that big of a deal. <laughs> um, so, yeah. If you're serious, which it sounds like you are, then I would probably just requalify in 2023. So, how does a big trend cycle impact your sex life? It doesn't. 
Can a lot of L-carnitine at once make you go hypoglycemic? Um, I have not experienced that. Opinion on Superdraw. I think it's overhyped, and people just like the name Superdraw. Kind of like how people like the name Hulk Tropin or Titty Tropin. It just sounds fun to say, so they want to use it, and they think it's awesome when it's not. Uh, what up, Tyler? Keith, two I use growth hormone 30 minutes before fasted cardio and two I use before bed sound beneficial for fat loss, assuming everything else is on point. Yes. Um, I won't speak my political beliefs. But I'll say there's plenty of blame with a particular group of people. I'm not sure how they how a particular group of people. I don't know. I haven't looked into it enough to know anything about it. I didn't even know that there was a shortage. Do you think I it would hold me for growing a bit? You know, maybe, but a lot of people say that there's a lot of benefit to getting show ready and growing off the rebound. You know, um, I don't know how how many months is between now and Canadian Nationals. You know, because um, I don't I don't know. You know, I I don't know. I think there's an argument for a lot of different ways. You know, um, like doing the show, you get the experience, experience, and then you get the rebound off of the show. Um, which a lot of people think is is really beneficial, and a lot of people think that it's it isn't that beneficial. <laughs> um, personally, I think the rebound is is a big deal, um, but you know, uh, John Jewett tends to feel that it's not. Um, so you know, something that I don't completely agree with him on. But um, I did have a very productive rebound from last show. Yeah, I mean, I feel like my, personally, I feel like my most productive time is immediately post-diet, you know, when I've been in a deficit for a long time, and like, you know, my show last year was the biggest and, you know, best rebound, um, best period that I had, um... So, I, I don't know. Um, I, I feel like if it was me, I probably would do the show and, uh, and go for the rebound. But, I don't know. It, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough decision because, like I said, I feel that there's, there's arguments for both ways, there, for both um, outcomes. I feel that either way, regardless of what you choose, you will make some serious progress so um yeah i think it would be i think it would be uh i mean if it's also it's your first year then i i would say go do it like if you qualified go do it because it's your first year you've got you've got lots of time um Um, the container shipping issues has messed up logistics for protein powder manufacturing too. Oh. Is ethyl oleate bad? I prefer not to inject it. I prefer to not use it in my products. I did for a while. Back in the day, I used to make all of my products with ethyl oleate. And I would use it to make my concentrations much higher. Um, but I personally don't feel that it is something that you want to be injecting long term. I'd rather stick to things that are a little bit more natural. You know? Um... The, the kind of thought process that I have about it is I I don't have a problem with, you know, cooking or eating uh, grapeseed oil. I don't have a problem cooking or eating MCT oil. I don't have a problem cooking or eating olive oil. I don't have a problem cooking or eating, 
you know, with all of these different oils that we can buy or make our steroids with. Ethyl oleate? I don't know if I would cook or eat that. <laughs> so, I don't know. Personally, I stay away from it. Uh, Mufaro, do your sources ship international? I want to homebrew. Homebrew source, yes. Why do you eat so much sodium? I just become a balloon face. I know San Everdeen promotes eating lots of salt, but gear causes so much bloat. I'm on Tell Me Sartin and maybe one to two grams of sodium. I don't use salt. Mm, why? Because it helps muscles contract. Um, our muscles, our cells have something called a sodium potassium pump in them that if you don't have enough sodium, then that pump doesn't work. <laughs> and muscles don't flex, muscles don't contract, you get cramps, you get some serious issues if you don't have enough sodium. Um, and being an athlete, being somebody that sweats often, trains often, we need more than the average individual. Um, especially if you want to be at your peak performance. So... I, uh, yeah, I get 8 to 12 grams of sodium a day, and it makes my food taste uh, great. So, um, if that's not what you're into, if you want your food tasting like crap, then sure, limit your sodium. Um, I don't know. I don't experience any bloat with it. I've been on 8 to 12 grams of sodium for the last three years at least so I don't know if it doesn't sit right with you that sucks because I think you're missing out but if it doesn't sit right with you it doesn't sit right with you and that's the way it goes do you get into fragrances slash colognes at all no I don't not not at all can I get the same benefits if I slept five hours at night and three hours at the day because I'm a Muslim and month of fasting is close same benefits? I'm going to say no, but it's going to be better than not. So, I would say do it because that's all that you can do. Um, but yeah, will it be will it be the same? No, not at all. Any specific carrier oil you recommend to use? I use MCT oil. All of my products are MCT oil. That's what I stick to. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. Cool. You guys ran out of questions in an hour. Amazing. Well. Good for me, good for you. We can get off of here and get on with our lives, right? Right. Right? Alright, cool. Well... I'm going to get off of here and I'm going to go make some dinner and hang out with my lovely wife and my dog. <laughs> and, uh, and I will see you all tomorrow on Friday. So thanks for stopping by. Catch you all tomorrow. <laughs>